Jack London In a Far Country When a man journeys into a far country, he must be prepared to forget many of the things he has learned and to acquire such customs as are inherent with existence in the new land. He must abandon the old ideals and the old gods, and oftentimes he must reverse the very codes by which his conduct has hitherto been shaped. To those who have the protean faculty of adaptability, the novelty of such change may even be a source of pleasure. But to those who happen to be hardened to the ruts in which they were created, the pressure of the altered environment is unbearable, and they chafe in body and in spirit under the new restrictions which they do not understand. This chafing is bound to act and react, producing diverse evils and leading to various misfortunes. It were better for the man who cannot fit himself to the new groove to return to his own country. If he delay too long, he will surely die. The man who turns his back upon the comforts of an elder civilization to face the savage youth, the primordial simplicity of the North, may estimate success at an inverse ratio to the quantity and quality of his hopelessly fixed habits. He will soon discover, if he be a fit candidate, that the material habits are the less important. The exchange of such things as a dainty menu for rough fare, of the stiff leather shoe for the soft shapeless moccasin, of the feather bed for a couch in the snow, is after all a very easy matter. But his pinch will come in learning properly to shape his mind's attitude toward all things, and especially toward his fellow man. For the courtesies of ordinary life, he must substitute unselfishness, forbearance and tolerance. Thus, and thus only, can he gain that pearl of great price, true comradeship. He must not say thank you. He must mean it without opening his mouth and prove it by responding in kind. In short, he must substitute the deed for the word, the spirit for the letter. When the world rang with the tale of Arctic gold and the lure of the north gripped the heartstrings of men, Carter Weatherby threw up his snug clerkship, turned the half of his savings over to his wife, and with the remainder bought an outfit. There was no romance in his nature. The bondage of commerce had crushed all that. He was simply tired of the ceaseless grind, and wished to risk great hazards in view of corresponding returns. Like many another fool, Disdaining the old trails used by the Northland pioneers for a score of years, he hurried to Edmonton in the spring of the year. And there, unluckily for his soul's welfare, he allied himself with a party of men. There was nothing unusual about this party, except its plans. Even its goal, like that of all other parties, was the Klondike but the route it had mapped out to attain that goal took away the breath of the hardiest native, born and bred to the vicissitudes of the northwest. Even Jacques Baptiste, born of a Chippewa woman and a renegade voyageur, having raised his first whimpers in a deerskin lodge north of the 65th parallel and had the same hushed by blissful sucks of raw tallow, was surprised. Though he sold his services to them, and agreed to travel even to the never-opening ice, he shook his head ominously whenever his advice was asked.